Hello, everyone. Welcome to this Harassis Global Panel Discussion. Really glad that you're all able to join us today for what promises to be an interesting conversation on some key climate questions. Our topic for today is being determined to meet net zero by 2050. That's a big topic, a lot goes into it. Estimates suggest that we need to spend nearly $10 trillion per year to resist or change the course of climate change. Governments and businesses could spend courageously and the global population might accept coherent actions. So to start off the discussion, our panelists will be exploring a couple of key questions. Uh, we'll then open it up to see if there are follow-on points from panelists, as well as possibly Q&A from the audience. So if you're in the audience and you'd like to ask a question, please indicate that using the platform functions and I'll call on you and make your microphone live at the appropriate time. Before we start, uh, allow me to briefly introduce myself. My name is Rick Wayman. I'm CEO of the Foundation for Climate Restoration, an NGO that educates and advocates for a restored climate where carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere return to pre-industrial levels around 300 parts per million by the year 2050. Before joining the climate movement last year, I spent many years working in the US and internationally for the elimination of nuclear weapons. I shared in the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize for our campaign's work to achieve the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons at the United Nations that year. It's an honor to be here and moderate this panel today with my distinguished colleagues, and I'll introduce them as, as we go along. So the first question for us to explore today is that leaders, and that's both business and government, leaders cannot do everything at once. What should they concentrate on? How do their decisions vary across geographies? So first, I want to turn it over to William Bonnet. Uh, Bill is chairman of the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center and is deeply involved in a number of other NGOs. Bill, over to you. Well, the, the, uh, the mechanism, Rick, as you know, is, is the yearly COP conferences where uh, the disparate needs and realities of 190 nations, uh, representatives from 190 nations come together. And I, I think it's fair to say that the progress to date has been uh, no better than a C, and that's probably charitable. Um, there's certainly an enormous amount of talking and, and certainly progress. But to your specific point, I'm not aware of uh, hard negotiating across across borders, so to speak. And if India is one of the creates a huge global problem about their continued use of coal plants, that is that is. Uh, not to date being acted upon or uh, concentrated on by the other 189 nations. Um, if, if France is made a commitment to, uh, to try and build more nuclear, uh, I'm not aware of the carryover uh, to have France helping out 189 nations to do more with their own next-gen nuclear plants. So I'm not sure we're seeing the kinds of collaborations at, the, at that level that, that we need, and that's just for starters. There are a million other ways to approach that question, but that's one way. Yeah, great. Excellent point. Thank you, Bill. And uh, I look forward to diving into that a little bit deeper later on in our conversation. Uh, so next, I want to uh, introduce Sylvia Vaquer. Sylvia is co-founder and chief creative officer at Socio Fabrica, 
an independent digital agency specializing in design and engineering services. And Sylvia, are you in San Francisco right now? I am indeed. All right, fantastic. So Sylvia, over to you. Sure thing. Well, um, this is a very important topic and, and certainly it hopefully has become more and more salient to governments and businesses alike, especially during the pandemic and, and post. Um, and one of the issues to dovetail on, on Bill's point, it is that there's a lot of talk, but not a lot of action. Um, and I think action is, is, a, is something that has to come both from the government and the businesses side. Um, I know there's countries that have been more responsible, right, for um, getting us to where we are in terms of climate change. Um, but also there's a lot of, there's been a lot of commitments some of those countries have made both in the short and the long term. However, the lack of a body, um, be it through the NATO or um, any other organization, to oversee the actual enactment of those commitments, I think has led to a lot of empty promises in the long term. And so um, it would be really interesting to see not only laterality and seeing how countries are starting to uh, cross borders, communicate and have discussions about the effects each of their actions have in other bordering and beyond regions, but also how can we um, better foster actual implementation of the strategies that have been so widely discussed. Great. Thanks, Sylvia. And our third panelist is Mark Verissimo. Mark is executive chairman of Lighter Capital. He brings over 40 years of banking experience, much of it working with technology companies. Uh, Mark, really happy to have you here today. Uh, over to you. Yeah. Um, I, you know, clearly the, the first two um, participants, you know, outlined the issues we're having. And, and I think the issues are we haven't, um, we, we didn't start with a transition plan. We went right to we need to be carbon neutral 2050. We didn't look at, okay, how do we deal with the developing countries who want to improve the standard of living for their people, such as India and China? And China continues to build coal fire plants and, and a lot of them, so that the, between them and India, they overwhelm whatever the West could do. So we haven't addressed that issue. The other thing we haven't addressed is the developed countries, whether it's Europe, the US, and people. Um, there's not the commitment to lower my standard of living to get the climate change, to get the net zero. So then the issue is in democracies, we've got to, we've got to have the majority of people go along with whatever we want to do. And again, by summarily, at least in the U.S., no nuclear, get rid of natural gas. Then you're sitting there, okay, how, what is the transition plan? You know, do I have power outages every day? Uh, does gasoline go to $14 a gallon? And just what we've seen recently with the Ukraine, it doesn't seem like the, even the governments in power that support climate change really have the backbone to say, no, $6 gallon, $7 gallon gas is good because we don't want you driving a lot. And we're going to have to live with some power issues, et cetera. So to me, it's re-looking at, okay, transition. There might be some terms of transitional technologies, such as natural gas, well, a minor, a lower carbon emitting fossil fuel and nuclear, et cetera, to get us to the promised land. Um, and I guess the next point, we'll talk about ways that we possibly could do that. Yeah, definitely. And Mark, you know, that's, that's something I was, I was thinking about a little bit yesterday when I was hearing about uh, some European nations that are trying to transition away from uh, Russian sourced fossil fuels and kind of the immediate need to invest in uh, various infrastructure that, that will allow other natural gas to, to come in to their territory, but ultimately 
um, they've also got to be thinking about how to how to get beyond that, right? Um, yeah. Not not to rely on natural gas forever, but yeah. how do you transition in in um, an emergency situation, right? So whether you consider that emergency to be uh, what's happening with Russia and Ukraine, whether you consider that emergency to be the climate crisis that we're living right now, whatever it is, uh, I totally agree that that transitions have to happen, and um, and and they need to to happen with um, some sensibility and and some um, business approach in mind, right? Um, mm-hmm. If if we've got so much money as a nation or as a company or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got to figure out how much do we allocate in the short term for transition versus how much do we uh, allocate in the long term uh, for the ultimate, uh, hopefully much cleaner transition. Um, so, Bill, I want to go back to you and and see if you have any thoughts on transitions, how, how that might be done uh, in a way that that is equitable, that's balanced, uh, and, and really that makes sense. And, and either speak either kind of from a, a government perspective, a business perspective, or just as a, as a citizen, how, how, do, how do you see this playing out? Well, it's not playing out well in the short, in the short term, as we all know. Um, you know, there, there, are, there have been moments in the last, let's say, 10 years when when the magic words cap and trade seem to be advancing in the public uh, uh, sort of consciousness, never really getting close to what, what the economists would say might be the might be the best single way to change behaviors. And we're we're probably farther away from that than ever right now because uh, of of among other things, Ukraine and the, the short-term hit we're taking in terms of gas prices, and the cap and trade advocates. Um, you know, in theory, I guess I'm one of them, but we don't have a realistic way to impose cap and trade at four four dollars and fifty cents a gallon or anything higher. So there's a there's a short-term, real-world kind of constraint that we're we're operating under. Uh, the transition, when the history books are written, there's no question this will be an extremely challenging period for the climate movement, which is going to have to fight very hard to uh, hold its own uh, during this period of, 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 of geopolitical turmoil. So it's, a, it's not making the job easier. To the extent you can look out five years and be more optimistic about increased pace of, of renewables in Europe, for example, that might that might give us all a little more optimism. But this transition is going to be difficult. And make, I, I, to, to add, I think there is not enough attention, and Rick, you sound like you know the numbers very well. Um, we have to start by a, sort of a global recognition that that we need to start stabilizing and decreasing the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. And all we're doing right now with all that we're doing, and it's considerable, is barely holding our own and inexorably the CO2 parts per million keeps climbing year after year after year. And we're not even cutting the growth in CO2 below the growth in global GDP. So there's a measurement right there of just how far we have to go. So there's a sort of a pessimistic take on transition, but hopefully I'll get more optimism out of the two of you. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Um, Sylvia, whether you're optimistic or not, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I think it is it is definitely, there are days I'm optimistic and there are days I'm not. Is that... <laughs> Is that a little crazy? Um, it's just, it is it is definitely going to be a really difficult uh, transition, but what is the alternative? It's what I always um, ask 
of other people um, when I'm discussing these topics. You know, what is the alternative? There's no planet B, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think it is definitely, to, to Bill's point, it is a problem of aligning priorities in a global scale where um, obviously it's like a little... Oh, now that I am developed, I can impose this on you and, you know, and forget the rest of the people in your developing countries. Um, so th there's a little bit of that, you know, what is ethical, what is correct. But um, I ultimately think that, that um, if one, one, one thing is important is we have to reimagine what quality living standard is and what uh, we as the West have been exporting of that be to the extended world, because in it lies a, a problem, right? Where overconsumption, uh, you know, ginormous houses, consuming a lot of gas, uh, gas costlers, et cetera, et cetera, has been exported as the lifestyle to acquire and aspire to. And so, it is also, I think, the responsibility of the West to help with that retooling of a messaging of what is to live quality standard of living um, and then help help with that transition as much as possible. I think when thinking about a transition, it is always important to take into consideration, yes, short and long term. Um, I hear your point, Mark, in terms of natural gas. Obviously, natural gas is methane. So it is a little bit problematic from a climate change standpoint. Um, so there's other technologies that are now more readily available that other governments could push. Um, you know, like it's been happening in the United States with the push to solar um, and a lot of the different programs that have been implemented over the last few years. But um, ultimately, I think it is important that everyone aligns on these issues and then redrafting priorities based on that, because it will happen in the shorter or longer standpoint. But the longer that we kick the can down the road, the more abrupt that transition is going to be and the harder it's going to be for everyone. Yeah, great point, Sylvia. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so yeah, Mark, I, in your opening comments, you talked about uh, one of one of the challenges being uh, individuals changing their own behavior uh, mm -hmm. as as relates to personal carbon footprints, et cetera. Uh, anything else you want to say there, or um, taking it uh, taking it more broadly into government um, government responsibilities for easing everyone into the the inevitable transition yeah um uh, before I, uh, just briefly talk about individual i mean I've, I've spent time in it's been a few years but spent, spent time in china and clearly talking to the officials there and i'll just get back several years there was a strong um push to make sure that they're raising the standard of living of their population and so what they were, all the things they were doing was trying to economically raise people up. And granted, the party stays in power because it does keep people in relatively happy that way. Part of that was driving cars. Part of it was eating meat, which, you know, that consumption has gone up across the world, et cetera. So I, uh, and, and then, you know, even with the Paris Climate Accords, we did carve out big openings for China and India to keep producing carbon. And there, their argument was, wait a second, you're rich and I'm not, you know, I, you guys need to let me catch up. And you guys reduce your standard of living. Then you can hear the U.S. and you go, yeah, for people living on the coast or New York, San Francisco, they make a lot of money. It's, it's, it's not much of a, of a hit for your average American out there um, to see their gas bill double in a year. That's a huge chunk out of it. So, so then what I've seen is California. One of the vanguards of climate change in America, they're they're contemplating sending out four hundred dollars per vehicle to offset the cost of gas. And my issue, that makes no sense um, because you're paying people to put carbon in the atmosphere, and yet everything else you're doing is trying to do it. it it's almost like I, I heard a good comment by venture capitalists called um, um, subsidize. 
demand restricts supply. And that's kind of where we're at right now where, okay, we don't want to drill oil. We don't want to natural fracking. But on the other hand, we're going to subsidize people driving cars and using, you know, fossil based fuel. And that's where I think the, the transition breaks down. So my point, and I've seen this argued several places, is you talk 10 trillion a year. The question is, you know, that's a lot of money, even if the world didn't have any other problems to deal with. And we've got lots of priorities that everybody has in every country and every society. And so that amount of money, and I think, at least in the U.S., we had modern mon monetary theory, which says, oh, you can spend whatever money you want to spend. Well, it, that might be breaking down a little bit, which means even we don't have an unlimited pot of money. So one solution has been, um, let's act like we did during war, and that is the government would put a certain side money for R&D and research and development. The government wanted to direct the R&D, meaning they're not driving it, but they'd be putting out there for good ideas. So it could be carbon capture. It could be fusion. It could be next generation nuclear. Um, and that might be a more efficient way to try to get to where you ultimately want to be um, because I think carbon capture is going to be part of it because I don't think we're slowing carbon in the atmosphere anytime soon, which means the carbon is going to keep building. So are there ways to start capturing some of that carbon out of the atmosphere to do it? Do we need nuclear? Um, because do we need a base level power in our grid system? Solar is great. Wind is great. But if the sun don't shine, there isn't much solar. If the wind doesn't blow, there's no wind. And we don't yet have the, the storage capacity. And we have to develop ways of storing it. You could say, well, better batteries. Well, if you get all the electric cars and you get all these batteries for this, where's the lithium going to come from? Where are, the, where are the specialized metals we need? What environmental damage do you do the, to the earth to get all those metals out and get them where you want to go? So... Again, I've spent my life in technology, so maybe I, I bias that way. But I think that's probably might be a more effective way to go after this problem. And again, in the interim, um, again, would I like natural gas? No, but I do know that, like in the U.S., we've decommissioned coal plants and put more into natural gas. And actually, our CO2 emissions, I, I read one place, and this may not be, I think it was The Economist magazine, maybe wrong, that we might have been one of the only countries to meet the Paris Accords because of this transition we we're making away from coal to natural gas. And so what I'm looking for is a short term, shorter term solutions um, to keep the developed countries on board and to keep actually the populations in developed countries on board with where we're going. And you don't have a you know revolt at some point where people go. I can't afford the gas. I can't afford the power. Nothing's working. Therefore, I'm going to toss out the politicians that put me into this climate change, and we're just going to go on as if nothing's going, nothing's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Uh, amazing points there. And uh, that's that's one thing I think about all the time in terms of a democracy with a, a short uh, election cycle. Yeah. Um, people people want to get voted in again. Right. And, and so the, the short term desire to, to make that happen uh, can. Well, we see it all the time. It, it very frequently uh, pushes the the longer term common good aside or, or at least to the back burner. Uh, Sylvia, looked like you had a, a comment you wanted to add. Yeah, I just wanted to add to Mark's point. The R&D I know has started. I'm not sure how much of a funding there has been, but I know in the last year and a half, there's been a few. Uh, calls for submission from the government for different technologies. Um, I think sequestration was one of them, if I remember correctly, um, carbon sequestration. And there was a second one. I'm trying to dig them quickly so I could uh, add them to the conversation chat. Secondly, um, but I, I agree with you, these are great strategies, but there sh it should be part of like a broad set of strategies, right? When you're trying to do a transition, you just need to tackle every angle. Um, secondly, I think uh, 
the, the other point I wanted to bring was about, I wanted to ask you, I know Mark, you have been part of the financial kind of side of things for a really long time. What's your point of view on carbon taxation? Um, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've tried to read as much as I could about it. And unfortunately, when you read stuff, they either have a agenda of one or, direction or the other yeah. direction. So it's very hard to, to find a balanced view of what what works. And then you've got all the, you know, industry groups and the lobbyists, and they're all trying to tweak it or do this or that. And then you end up, you know, you know where you want, want to be. In theory, it sounds like a good way to go, meaning, um, you know, people who are polluting or putting a lot of carbon in the atmosphere, there's an issue there. And how do we get them to um, have to pay more for something that they're doing to the environment that you can't really cost in the capital market, capitalistic system? Um, but what I worry about when I read some of these things is they, is they get so, I use the word, bastardized going from theory what it should be to what actually comes out the other end because of all the lobbying and all the special interest groups and everybody going this way that, you know, I'm concerned that it, that it won't do what we want it to do um, because, because of those pressures. Um, yeah. I, it's just, it's, it's been touted. I know in Europe specifically, there's programs that have been started to consider it. It's been touted as a, as a potential source for the, what was trillion dollar figure you mentioned earlier that we need to be putting in. Um, as a, as a way of uh, also adding to that um, that bucket, sort of speak. Mm -hmm. um, and I know there's a lot of uh, discussion around it, um, but it also it also is a way of making sure that those that account for benefiting the most, in a profit mm -hmm. standpoint, from emitting carbon, are also somewhat responsible for cleaning carbon. But yeah. again, I know financial instruments are complex and complicated and yeah. sometimes they don't get implemented as they should. Yeah. So I want to turn the floor back over to Bill here in a second. But first, uh, we had a comment come through uh, addressed to Mark. So Mark, I don't know if you saw that, but I'll, I'll read it out loud here. It says, Mark, you didn't mention geothermal as a renewable yeah. baseload power source. Yeah. Uh, U.S. Department of Energy estimates the potential in the U.S. at 540 gigawatts. Uh, and the brine could be a source of lithium. Win-win. Yeah. Any yeah. comments on that? Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I, I read some things about geothermal, I think. And I think some ways geothermal, geothermal can be also a baseload um, um, uh, baseload supplier of energy into the system. So at least my, and again, I'm not a scientist, but at least my understanding of geothermal, it's a constant um, uh, um, direction of energy versus sun and wind, which goes up and down. So yeah, I forgot to mention that, but I, yeah, I think geothermal is, is a very interesting um, area, which again, I'd love to see... Um, like you said, Sylvia, there's been some investment, you know, is the U.S. putting 30 or 60 billion dollars a year into that? I mean, what we did during the Cold War with a war, we invested, again, the Department of Defense, the U.S. government put out a lot of research and development. You know, a good chunk of that ended up in the commercial area. Um, but I think we need to have the same kind of attitude towards this, you know, quote unquote, war that we have going on. And again, I put a lot of money in geothermal, carbon capture, nuclear energy, I mean, out there. And also technologies we haven't, um, they're just in some scientist's mind somewhere. And we need to, to think about it more or develop it more. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of, uh, a, a lot more investment and interest from the Department of Energy in yeah. carbon capture, in carbon removal, uh, similar similar thing um and also very interesting to me is uh the the private sector's involvement in trying to drive some of that innovation as well for example the uh the carbon removal x prize 
that was funded at a hundred million dollars by the <laughs> Musk Foundation. Yeah. Uh, and and just uh, a few weeks ago, they announced fifteen interim solutions that are looking really positive. Each of those fifteen received a, a one million dollar interim prize to keep on going. Uh, but but that's that's a really interesting way that um, that others outside of the government are driving innovation in in an important way. Yeah, I might I might add just real quick. Um, the reason I was pushing government funding for this is versus private equity, venture capital, the private sources in general, was that a lot of this is just basic research, raw R and D. And the private markets really aren't set up for that, meaning they're good at taking some basic technology that's been developed so much and then commercializing it from there. So if you look at a lot of the you know, technologies, a lot of them, again, started out as um, somewhat university or government, you know, government through the university or directly by the government, sort of doing that basic research that got the technology up to a certain point that then people could see the commercial opportunities of it because private investment, you know, it doesn't have a 30 year timeline, <laughs> you know, it's five years, right. 10 years, 15, which still is not short, but you know, you need that boost from government. And it could be the, you know, if you combine globally, if everyone committed a certain percentage of their GDP, maybe it was a hundred billion, 200 billion in global basic raw research in this area. And I think that could really power a lot of um, development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great points, Mark. Um, Bill, I want to put the microphone back in your hands. Uh, any anything from this conversation of the past few minutes that that you wanted to add anything on? Well, all all, all of the above, of course, and they're 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 all important. Let me just highlight a couple of new twists, a couple of new angles. Uh, I'll take a poll here of the four of us. Uh, if you asked a thousand scientists, uh, climate scientists, are are the are the temperature trends uh, looking better than let's say they were ten or twenty years ago? Looking the same or looking worse? What do you think a thousand scientists would say? Worse. Worse. Okay. I would say worse. Yeah, me too. So it's it's relatively under discussed and appreciated that the 2050 construct, which the globe has adopted now for basically for 30 years, um, is it deserves a lot more attention. Whether it's going to be uh, aggressive enough. And I'll, I'll, one, there's so many anecdotes in this, in this regard, but a lot of the corporate commitments and the university commitments and the major institutional players, if you run down the list of the S&P 500 or the top 100 universities, whatever you want to say, most of their targets are in the 2040s. You know, we're going to reach net zero by 2045. For 2050, we all, all of us interested in this, have to really examine quite aggressively whether, uh, and it's going to be a few years so we come to a new consensus, whether that's fast enough. And if, if my alma mater, take Princeton, for Princeton to say we're we're proud of the fact that we're making X Y Z hundred million dollar investments and we plan to be net zero by 2045. If you replicate that across the globe, that's that's perilously late. So that's one point. Um, uh, you know what? I could go on forever. So let's let's just stick. Let's yeah. just stick with that for a moment because I think we all have to pay attention to more aggressive targets, doing all the things that Mark and Sylvia and you were talking about. 
Yeah, great. Thanks, Bill. And uh, Sylvia, I, I see a comment from you here in the chat, but uh, why don't you unmute yourself and, and talk a little bit more about that? I think I think Bill is like spot on. Um, you know, there is that's where I see there's a huge communication like disjointment in between it, like what governments are saying they will do and what they should be doing, and also what businesses say they should do versus what they should be doing. To your point, yes, in twin, in like 2000, like 2030 or like a 2050 at 1.5 seemed attainable. Today, we know that's impossible, like in the track record where we're at, 1.5 above, um, you know, pre-emissions. Uh, so I just think that there's this huge disconnect between um, the urgency with which actions need to be taken and the actual actions that are being taken. So a lot of companies are praised, praised and are being praised for saying that they're going to be net zero in the next like 10 years. Some The earliest I've seen is like 2035 or something around that. Um, when the reality for the action, for like actually mitigating climate change for the worst of climate change is that what they should be tracking towards is zero carbon, not net zero, right? There's a huge difference. And obviously this is a marketing spiel where net zero is just about you mitigating your carbon emissions by offsetting, you know, buying carbon credits and so many other mechanisms that exist in the marketplace right now. Whereas being zero carbon is like you're being 100% within your supply chain, making sure that you're keeping as close loop as possible, right? Um, that is an aspiration, and that's what people should be tracking towards, businesses and governments. But it is, it is an even more abrupt transition. So. Yeah, definitely a, a more abrupt transition. But, I, I mean, to, to your point there, Sylvia, that is a goal. Right. If that if we achieve that goal, we're doing really well. Whereas if we achieve net zero by 2050, don't. Yeah. I mean, we're we're based on what we're seeing right now in, in today's climate. That's not a pretty picture. Twenty eight years from now, uh, continuing somewhat business as usual or not an urgent enough uh, change of direction. Um, so we've got a few minutes left here. Uh, I want to go back to, to Mark. Um, any, any thoughts there on, uh, on, uh, what, what Bill and Sylvia just had to say? Um, yeah, it, it is, yeah. Zero carbon versus net zero. Um, I, um, you know, I'm just maybe end with a comment that, um, again, you're trying to, maybe I'll put, just talk about us and Western Europe democracies, whatever, you're always signaling to the population what you think priorities are. And the problem is when I see some of the things out there, the the signals seem to be a little mixed. And that is um, you can't have the U.S. climate czar running around in a private jet and then saying everybody else has to cut their carbon footprint. Um, I remember seeing photos in, um, it might have been People Magazine or something like that, where there was a climate um, a climate conference in um, Europe, and uh, you know they had entertainers there. They had all these, these people, and there were shots of them, you know, sort of um, around uh, um, Ferraris. And again, to me, it's all it's all messaging because a lot of people read a People Magazine or they read various things, and their attitude is, well, if you guys aren't doing anything then why should I, this obviously is not a crisis because if you guys aren't doing it, then it's not a crisis. So I think that, again, as we're thinking about how do we get people on board in a more consistent way and willing maybe even to sacrifice, they have to see sacrifice across the socioeconomic spectrum. If they think they're the ones taking all the burden and the upper class are taking none of it, which, you know, especially in humankind, that's what typically happens. They're not going to buy in as much to, to what we're doing. So I think people at all levels, even the leaders, government, companies, whatever, have to be 
very cognizant of the image that they're presenting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, the, yeah, this is a, a branding issue that you're bringing up, a, um, a, a communications issue. Uh, Sylvia, this is your wheelhouse. What, what, what do you have to say about that? <laughs> That's all the... <laughs> This is like you just open Pandora's box, yeah. you know. If you, if you, and and I'm just. I know we have only a few minutes, but um, if you think about it, Hollywood became kind of the standard for exporting Western culture across the world, especially with mass consumption media like television and movies. Um, and so there is a little bit, or I would say a lot of responsibility that lies there in terms of the producers, the culture producers, as they're called, to um, reimagine and reconsider what has been exported so that we are shifting these narratives of what people are aspiring to elsewhere, right? Whereas where you're not thinking, uh, like, where the, you know, it goes down to small things, right? Like, where, how are you traveling? How are you considering mobility? Um, what are you wearing? What are the things, where are you getting those things? You know, how much water are you using? How big are the places that you're shooting things at? Um, and so there's a lot of subtle messages that go here and we can go into this rabbit hole about this, but uh, certainly those are the images that are being produced and manufactured and exported as the things to aspire to. And that is problematic because that can no longer be the world that we should aspire to if we want to have a world all together that we can live in. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, so we've just got a couple minutes left here, and, and I want to make sure that everyone gets uh, some final words in. So, uh, Bill, any uh, anything in closing, uh, reflections on what we've talked about or, or anything else you want to share? Um. Uh, EVs, uh, the, that transition can and should move uh, even faster um, because if you think about it, how many, how many, again, let's do a poll, of every thousand owners of an electric vehicle now, how many would trade them back in for a gas-powered vehicle? Very few. Okay, there we go. Yeah, very few. So, so one one hopeful way to think about electrification is here's an example of a argue you know a demonstrably a superior way to provide a driving experience and that transition there's no inherent reason why that transition shouldn't happen even more rapidly because if you can bring prices down in lithium and I, I do a lot of this work uh, there are a lot of complexities that I get, but the truth of the matter is uh, you, you have remarkable unanimity in a relatively short period of time that electric vehicles are the way to go. So that's, that's a hopeful piece here, and we should all, I think, glom on in any way, shape, or form to accelerate the EV transition mm -hmm is creating some momentum in this area that we, we've we spent an hour uh, decrying the lack of momentum. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Mark, any, any last thoughts from you? Um, I, I guess last thoughts is I'm, I'm somewhat optimistic because I think humans are adaptable and humans are inventive. And we've clearly seen, you just mentioned the EV vehicle, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago would we have thought that was, you know, that was possible. So um, I'm betting on human ingenuity and, um, and adaptability that uh, we will get through this, this um, crisis. Well, we figured out how to get ourselves into the crisis. So <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Let, let's figure out a way to get out. Yeah. Um, Sylvia, last words from you. Um. I think that I, I, I want to be in Mark's camp of being optimistic or as we should say, carefully optimistic about being able to tackle these changes. But I, I do want to benchmark that with a fact that a lot more people need to take this very seriously and actually act. Um, I think for many people, this is a nice to have, uh, especially on the business side, whereas it, 
ought to be and ought to have. Like if your business wants to survive, you definitely need to address this. Yeah, fantastic. Well, uh, I want to really thank the three of you so much for, for sharing your okay. thoughts. This was a great conversation. I really enjoyed the time that we had together. Uh, thanks to everyone who tuned in and uh, look forward to staying in touch with, with all of you and um, making change together. Great. All right. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.